Hello everybody and welcome back. I hope you had a lovely break. I managed to get a cup of tea or a glass of water and, and managed to stretch yourselves out a little bit. Um, and for those that are just joining us, welcome uh, to the very final session of the Mindful Employer Leads um, Wellbeing at Work Conference. Can't quite believe we're on the final day. Um, if you haven't, um, if you have just joined us and we've not met before, I'm Karen. I work for Volition at Forum Central, which is the collective voice of the health and social care third sector in Leeds. And I'll be uh, hosting the rest of the session today. Um, so we're into our last session, as I said, and it's around um, a conclusion to the week. So we're going to be um, firstly hearing uh, some reflections of the week from Michelle scaly Clark, who's uh, the resident poet for the conference, who's been listening into the sessions throughout the week um, and thinking and reflecting and will do so as beautifully as she as she does um, in a few moments time uh, to help us wrap everything up. We'll then go on to hearing from um, some key speakers. So we've got Joe, who's the director at Time to Change, and Paul, the CEO from Mind, um, who are going to be giving us their reflections on the legacy of COVID-19 and the priorities for the coming months. Um, we'll then have some space for um, questions and answers. So do be thinking those through. Um, and then we'll we'll wrap the session up um, by hearing from Victoria, who's the uh, director of public health at Leeds City Council. Um, so as you did in the in the previous session, please use the chat. Please reflect with each other and comment as we go through um, the the sessions this morning. And as I say, if you've got any questions for our, our final two speakers, then I will encourage you to share those, and we'll be able to um, get them to our, um, our guest speakers. For them to answer. So without further delay, I will pass you over to Michelle, who's um, going to be um, reflecting and giving her um, creative response to the sessions that we've had throughout the week. Hello, everybody. Hello again. Um, it's me again. Um, thank you very much for um, allowing me to be part of this week. Um, I've gone into as many workshops as I can and um yeah so i came and this is the piece that um i've developed is kind of what i came away with and i know that we all come away with different things but i hope this reflects the collective as well let's start at the very beginning we are human our normality stopped a year of fog all thrown into the trauma of pandemic. Impact felt and we're still in it. Do death, jobs, unemployment, suicide, poverty, race and gender hate rising. Relationships, work, pictures in a state of being continually changing. And the tidal wave of grief, loss hitting our shores, swimming, drowning, diving and surviving and one-to-one -one, we've all experienced some form of panic are you all right behind i'm fine can you manage a corridor of mental health a journey well traveled yet the light is here accessible to all if we can help to find it we are all different yet together we can be stronger creating a supported environment where conversations can occur the answer may not be found in the first conversation but the ground is laid for engaging open space to explore leading with human empathy honest and vulnerable there are better ways to do things if we're hearing each other allowing the power of kindness to define the way we work together and treat each other sharing practices and strategies between business and creative community learning and improving growing safer workplace culture there has never been a better chance for leaders and managers and organizations to step up to the plate to lead with well-being practice, to create a safe space, to relearn, regroup, ask for help and train, to be fallible, be you, be honest, be true, have faith in the role and believe things will get better. Organisationally, 
what have we found in this lived shared experience how do we relate to self and each other finding relationship to self really matters are we as kind to self as we are to others is our workplace culture helping or hurting can we manage the hoovers and energy vampires recognizing critical thoughts and changing negative behaviors feeling safe to speak out speak up embedding well-being policies and positive expectations grasping the metal to honor the values of your organization preparing the ground for no right no wrong listening non-judgmentally without gaslighting inputting or trying to fix empathy can be silent and listening recognizing we all need recovery from the top of the branches down to the root of the tree removing the stigma gathering seeding growing changing our ideas work practice networking for we are forever entwined in this tapestry the paintings the work life families shared memories so turn up for yourself and how you are feeling your daily well-being your breathing and your healing what did you bring? What did you take away? What will be in your work culture today? Give yourself a pat on the back. You're part of the healing. Let's recover. We are and set a new beginning. For we are human. Namaste. Wow, thank you, Michelle. What a, a beautiful, um, impassioned and powerful poem that you've managed to sum up a week's worth of discussions and conversations so wonderfully. I know there's lots and lots of, of praise for that in, in the chat, people saying how beautiful um, and what a, what a way you have with words and you know, people's hair standing on edge. Personally, I feel really energized by listening to you and it's such a positive way to end these sessions. So thank you very much for that. Um, Okay, so we're going to move on to our next um, speakers. Um, so the next two speakers um, I'll introduce in turn, but just to remind you that um, we have um, opportunity to ask um, questions after this. So um, pop them in the chat, we'll make sure we catch them um, and ask them of our speakers. Um, so without further ado, I will first pass you to Joe Lochran, who's the Director of Time to Change. Good afternoon. Um, I am uh, Jo Lochran, I am the director of Time to Change. Um, uh, as you know, we're pre-recording some of these uh, some of these uh, sessions, and I just wanted to share with you that I've just gone through my entire presentation, um, but didn't actually realise that it wasn't recording. So um, here is try number two, and um, let's hope that the technology um, doesn't let me down in quite the same way uh, this time. So, as I say, I'm Jo Lochran, I'm the director of Time to Change. Um, it's lovely to be with you, and um, thank you for the invite. Um, as many of you know, uh, Time to Change is a growing um, social movement of people changing how we all think and act towards those of us with mental health problems. Our vision has always been um, about uh, an inclusive society where people's lives are not limited by mental health stigma and discrimination. And we've looked to do that by challenging stigma and discrimination at societal, at institutional, at community and at individual levels. Um, the most important key ingredients for us, though, has been people with lived experience in leadership roles throughout the programme, from our governance structure through to individual and campaign champions who are campaigning at grassroots level. And another clearly um, important part of our work is building sustainability and embedding the work that we do through the organisational cultural uh, of our employers, of our institutions like schools and colleges, and via broader partnership working, as well as training and supporting champions to challenge stigma and discrimination when they see it, 
when they hear it and when they experience it for themselves. And obviously the importance of that is uh, not lost on us um, at the present time as we march towards the end of the official infrastructure um, of, of time to change. So we know uh, what works to achieve phenomenal attitude and behaviour change um, that we've seen since 2007. Um, and for us, it's that combination of interrelated uh, core projects to achieve our stated aims. And those have included our work with um, secondary schools, with young people, with parents, with teachers, um, our employers work where we are continuing to encourage employers to um, uh, create uh, workplaces that um, are open, that are understanding um, of the culture uh, around mental health problems um, in the workplace. We also look to um, localise and to embed our activities in communities across um, England and that PR and communication uh, function has played a really pivotal role in the work that we've done in trying to utilise insights driven uh, social marketing campaigns to deliver um, a behaviour change in key target um, audiences. Not only have organisations who've signed the time to change been pivotal in the work that we have done uh, to change attitudes and behaviour, but also other partnerships, pro bono partnerships with organisations and, and collaborations with organisations such as Ford and PG Tips um, and McVitie's to name um, just a few. I don't think it's an underestimation to, um, uh, to state that we are a kind of sector leading evidence driven uh, campaign and that research and evaluation has been a key part in how we've understood whether or not we have made the change um, that we are seeing in society or indeed to be able to just see what the change is um, at societal level. But before we look forward, I wanted just to take a few minutes of your time just to look back and to reflect a little on the last um, 14 years of our work. Our overarching evaluation is conducted by the IOPPN, the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neurology at King's College London. And since 2007, what we know is that around 5.4 million adults in England have improved attitudes towards those of us with mental health problems. And that equates to about uh, an improvement of just short of, of 13%. Um, What's important is that that data has been taken from December 2018. And we are currently waiting for the final evaluation to come through from the IOPPN. And we're hoping to have that by the end of March, early April this year. <coughs> Excuse me. We've also seen an increase in people's stated willingness to live with, to work with, to live nearby, and to continue a relationship with somebody with a mental health problem. And that reduction um, is, is really looking at um, a reduction in the discrimination that people feel. It's reflected by the fact that we've seen um, an increase in, in, in people's personal experience of discrimination. 61% of our um, champions also feel more confident um, about challenging stigma and discrimination. And for us, that's really, really important that people feel that they can go off and challenge stigma and discrimination on their own terms and in their own way um, has been quite a, 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 you know, quite an important part of our work. But of course, we don't do any of this work in isolation or alone. We um, have uh, more than 7,500 champions campaigning for change on a day-to-day -day basis. We're currently working to repermission those um, champions across to mind of rethink mental illness so that we can alert them to opportunities to continue activism um, uh, as they feel uh, that they will, will want to do. We chose to invest heavily in um, the training and the support of champions um, to campaign in the, on their own or in, in their campaigning groups so that they could challenge stigma and discrimination regardless of whether the infrastructure of time to change um, was there. We're also highlighting opportunities for our champions to become involved in our hub network for those hubs that are continuing to deliver after March of this year um, so that they can get involved in that kind of localised 
um, challenge of, uh, of stigma and discrimination and the status quo in relation to mental health. So we know we've got about 1,500 organisations that have signed the Time to Change pledge. And when we approximate that to the number of employees that means we've reached, it looks like we've reached about 4 million individuals, 4 million employees have been touched by our campaigning through their workplaces. So whilst the Time to Change pledge came to an end in uh, June of last year, organisations will be able to continue um, to get support from MIND, and I think you're going to hear from Paul about that later, and also from Rethink Mental Illness. We're currently um, seeking to re-permission those contacts so that we can um, have their permission to, to receive information from the two partner organisations. 3,500 schools, colleges and youth organisations have um, used our resources or been involved in direct campaigning alongside us since we set up the Children and People's Programme in 2011. So over the years, that means that we have probably touched the lives of about 6 million young people. And those 6 million young people will be the change in the generation that we've always talked about in relation to time to change and in relation to mental health, stigma and discrimination. Our 200 plus young champions are also being repositioned um, to find opportunities to continue the activism in mind and rethink. Our hub network of 50 um, hubs means that about a third of, the, um, of England's population live within an area that is served by a Time to Change hub. And those hubs, many of them, will be continuing um, into the future. It's also worth pointing out that we've got a really impressive social um, uh, and online following um, of almost 850,000 um, individuals. And again, we're looking to make sure that those individuals have somewhere, a home to go to, to continue the conversation around mental health, stigma and discrimination. So what's still to be done? Well, we know that there is still more work to be done to address mental health, stigma and discrimination at societal at institutional, at community, and at individual levels. Our insights research that we conducted in readiness for a phase four of Time to Change um, has really shown us and indicated to us that there are some who have simply not benefited equally from the societal change that we have contributed to in England over the last 14 years. Many are still severely impacted by stigma including those from racialized communities, um, those living in social deprivation, or living with an experience of complex mental health needs. Some conditions, symptoms, experiences, labels are still not well understood by the general population, including schizophrenia, bipolar, personality disorder in particular. So what will happen after the 31st of March, 2021? As employers, I'd really implore you to continue to prioritise mental health as a key principle in your workplaces. If you haven't already signed the Time to Change pledge, no fear. There are ways in which you can be supported in that goal through MIND and through Rethink Mental Illness. As Time to Change comes to an end, I personally want to thank all our champions, our supporters, our schools, our funders, the thousands of organisations that have worked alongside us to really achieve the phenomenal change that we can report because of the evaluation that we do with the IOPPN. We are leaving behind our resources and they'll be accessible on a static website. Our social media channels will continue to deliver some content and our champions and our hubs will continue to be able to campaign under the Time to Change brand through to November 2022. We know that Time to Talk Day will be uh, delivered in 2022 um, by our partner charities, Mind and Rethink Mental Illness. So we're really excited to see what that's going to look like and how we can all continue to get involved in that. And so, my last slide really, and if I asked you to do nothing else as a result of this um, uh, presentation, I'd really like to encourage you to visit the Time to Change website and to, to, to look for our impact series. 
So we wrote these um, series of impact series, uh, impact series so that we could um, leave behind something that helped, um, uh, helped people to, to understand our story, to understand what it was that we did to benefit from the research and development that we were able to put into the programmes of work that we have delivered since 2007. And so these impact series are, are a kind of step-by-step -step guide through um, what we did using case studies and also leaving top tips for people if they wanted to replicate what we did in our programmes of work over the last 15, 14 or 15 years. So please do go check those out um, and, uh, and you can see the link uh, on, the, uh, on the screen there. So finally, I just want to extend um, a huge personal thank you to everybody who's ever challenged uh, anybody, any institution, any organisation um, in relation to mental health stigma and discrimination. What we've done is we have changed the dial on mental health. We have changed the conversation um, and the narrative around uh, stigma and discrimination. We've enabled people to bring their whole selves to work, their whole selves to their communities and to their families and to their workplaces um, and, and their, leisure, uh, their leisure activities. And that is a phenomenal change that will simply never um, be undone. And I, I think that we should all be incredibly proud of the collective, uh, collective work that we've done and the collective achievement that we have made um, in changing the way in which people can experience a mental health problem and be able to talk about that. So thank you. I think we're going to go back now to live and I'm very happy to answer any questions um, that you might have at the end of this session. Thank you, Joe. So great to hear everything that you've just said. I, I've worked alongside Time to Change for a number of years in Leeds in, in various different roles and the the impact that Time to Change has had has, has been incredible. Uh, you know, I still have a collection of the postcards that I'll never give away um, that I just show just um, how amazing the, the resources and the support has been through Time to Change nationally um, for, for a long time. So thank you for that presentation. Um, I'm going to move on to um, hear from Paul now. So Paul Farmer, who's the CEO of Mind. Thanks very much indeed, Karen. Good morning, everybody. Really great to spend some time with you today. But I have to say from my house in London, how much I wish I was getting on a train and coming to Leeds. That is the kind of dream that I'm currently ho uh, holding on to, that I can clamber onto a train and come and spend some time um, physically um, uh, in Leeds with you. And um, you and colleagues have very kindly invited me to a couple of these excellent events over the years. And it's always a, a, a real pleasure to be able to spend some time with colleagues. So I'm hoping it won't be that 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 long before I'll be able to get back back onto a train. I never thought I'd be saying how excited I would I was to looking forward to getting on a train and uh, and spending some time spending some time on that train and then spending some time when you get there. So um, thanks very much for asking me and um, a huge thank you to Joe for uh, the extraordinary work that Time to Change has done over uh, the last 13, 14 years in tackling stigma and discrimination. Um, and such an important piece of work, I think, because the real test of that work and the work that many of you as employers have done over recent years in making the space around mental health more um, easier to talk about and more acceptable, um, the, one of the true tests of that started and took place almost exactly a year ago. Um, we know that when the lockdown started, organisations were forced to really think about the mental health of their people. And if you're one of the organisations involved in this network, I'm pretty sure that you thought about that really quickly. Uh, and uh, I'm really grateful and appreciative. And I know uh, we've heard from many employers up and down the country about how employers uh, thought carefully about looking after the mental health of their staff during this pandemic. Um, I'm sure none of us expected us still to be talking about it in the present um, uh, a year on, um, but I also know that um, we as employers have really thought and uh, considered and reflected how to uh, respond to the very important needs of our, 
of our people. And I was very struck by um, uh, one of the phrases in, in that, beautiful, uh, that beautiful poem uh, about the power of kindness. Uh, and very keen to, we'll to pick that up a little bit later on. So my job at this, uh, for this conference is to really reflect on what I think we've seen and learned and heard over the last uh, 12 months, uh, talk a little bit about the priorities for the next phase, if you like, and where I think we might be going in the future. So I suppose, first of all, um, uh, as I said earlier, in terms of my reflections, I think we've seen at Mind and uh, working with many colleagues, including our fabulous local minds across the country, including in Leeds, um, we've really thought about how we support people's mental health and thought about three particular groups of people. First of all, all those people with existing mental health problems, and we know that people have found uh, that this period incredibly challenging are Mind survey told us that roughly two thirds of people with existing mental health problems said their mental health got worse during the first lockdown period. Um, and we are, are seeing the consequences of that in terms of mental health services being um, extremely pressed at the moment as, um, uh, as they've managed to stay open and huge credit to colleagues who are working in mental health services for um, you know, really keeping the show on the road during the last a uh, few months to really ensure that people get help and support. We know it's been tough for people with existing mental health problems. The second group that we thought about are people who are at risk of developing mental health problems. And many of these people will be in your workplaces. They're the people who may be struggling with their mental health for a whole variety of different reasons. It might be because of work, it might be because of um, having to cope with homeschooling or cope with um, other issues in your personal lives, it might be coping with the loss um, or, or of a family member or the impact of uh, COVID on your communities. Um, and we know that that group of people, the group of people who are at risk of developing mental health problem is almost growing incrementally by the day. Um, as um, uh, as the risk factors around mental health um, increase during this period. And I think particularly during this second lockdown, people have found it hard. They've struggled. Uh, we've all struggled, uh, perhaps with the, uh, the sort of dark winter nights, with the, um, the, the finding it harder maybe to sort of uh, kind of get yourself up and going for um, the work, the working day ahead um, and feeling as though this has been going on for such a long time and the absence of some of our the protective factors that help our mental health stay well. And the third, but the third group that we thought about are the wider general public, many of whom, of course, are also in your workplaces. And we have to pay credit to people who have found ways to sustain and maintain their resilience during this time. People who have really um, uh, kind of taken the opportunity to think about how to look after your mental health. And we know uh, from our uh, web downloads that people have turned to minds and to other organizations in their millions to think about how do we look after our mental health even in these tough times whether that's um, making the most of the outdoors uh, taking the opportunity to use digital technology to connect with friends and family and loved ones um, or indeed just kind of switch finding a way to switch off work um, and take part in a pastime or a hobby that maybe you haven't been able to do before so so in, in that overall picture, we know that many people have managed to cope probably maybe a little bit better than they would have feared, but also uh, we know that there are large numbers of people who have really struggled during this time. And so that sort of impact is something that we have to bear in mind as we hopefully start to come out of this phase and um, think about what is going, what is going to happen next. Um, and into this mix, we know we have to take into account the very real impact on um, communities, uh, particularly uh, black, uh, Asian and minority ethnic communities who have been particularly affected by, um, uh, by this period, whether it's the consequence of the George Floyd incident or, the, uh, or indeed the impact of COVID on, on, on these communities. And we also particularly have to pay attention to our young people who have unquestionably had a really tough time as, um, uh, as, as they've had to go through exams or if you're at university, the kind of toing and froing of uh, the uncertainty around university. And there are many other groups besides who have particularly been affected and we need to pay attention to, to those groups going forward. 
And I particularly want to mention key workers, whether you're NHS or social care frontline workers, or um, people who work in, not, not necessarily in, in NHS or social care settings, but those of you who have worked um, in those frontline settings over this very long period of time to, um, to, to recognize the particular pressures that people will have faced during this period. So we have to make sure that as we hopefully do come out of this period, we're taking into consideration the starting points that everybody is at. And we're all going to have our own unique pressures and our own stresses to, to cope with. But we also are going to know that there are some opportunities and some challenges coming up in the near future. And that's the kind of phase I just want to focus on briefly now. So we know, first of all, that there are existing pressures. We don't, we're not going to flick switch and COVID will suddenly be over. Uh, and the mental health pressures around COVID are probably going to last for a lot longer than the physical dimensions of COVID for many people. Um, so we need to recognize that people will still have caring responsibilities, um, experience loneliness, uh, worry about family and friends. Um, and of course, we're constantly being exposed to that negative news, um, which can also have a negative impact on us. We know that coming, coming, coming up towards us as different government initiatives start to come to an end, we're likely to see increasing concerns and worries about finances, about job losses, um, and, uh, and, around, um, and around coping for many people with bereavement as well. So, um, and, and this is going to be a slow period, probably the rest of this year, when we're going to need, be needing to think about um, how we cope and we manage with all of that as we sort of come out uh, almost blinking out of this period, hopefully um, feeling safer because of the vaccination, uh, but also being able to take more, um, take more steps to reconnect with our friends, our families and our work colleagues. And so that's the, the third part of my short talk today is to think about some of the questions for us to ask as employers for the future. All of a sudden, the word hybrid working has become uh, the thing that we're talking about. But do we really know what we mean by that? Do we know what the implications of that are? Do we know what that what what that's going to feel like and look like for your people going forward? Um, is it a guarantee that we're all going to all go back to the office or indeed our places of work? Or are we going to want to uh, to take this more hybrid approach with more homework uh, taking place? And if we are, how are we going to make sure that uh, people's home uh, and work and life balance is truly achieved. We've heard a lot of people talking to us about their Zoom face, the face that they put on for this kind of event, where it's really easy to hide how you're really feeling about work and about life. And we also know that people have struggled to draw that distinction between work and life when the only thing you can do is literally drop the lid of your laptop and close it and then put it in a drawer somewhere where your workplace is also your eating place. So we know that there's some challenges around that as we go forward. And if that's going to be uh, a thing of the future, how are we going to support staff to get that right? Um, and so a few kind of tips to think about this. How are we going to help and support our employees to maintain a positive work-life balance? What can we do to reg check in with team members regularly to really ask that, are you OK question and be able to have that open and honest conversation with teams about it? What are those new ways of working? We, I, I'm, I'm a big fan, I think, of maybe this bit, the rest of this year being a testing period where you might want to take the opportunity to try some slightly different approaches um, in the course of the next few weeks, building on the learning that you've had from this period, but also thinking about what people cherish about going back to work in different, different settings. The, and of course, the benefits of a whole load of uh, tools that are existing already. So the sort of successor to the Time to Change Employers Pledge is the Mental Health at Work Commitment. Please do go to the Mental Health at Work website and sign up to the Mental Health at Work Commitment, um, which will allow you to make a public statement about your commitment to your staff. And on that site, you'll also see find huge amounts of resources um, based on the best of what other organizations are doing to be able to help you. Um, technology. Uh, I'm sure in the question time, we might have a question about whether technology has been a, a, a kind of a positive or a negative. Um, you know, what can we do to, there's no doubt it's here to stay. What are we going to do to harness it and also to manage it in a way that means that we're not 
it's we're not being controlled by the technology, but we are controlling the technology. And how do we help people to use the support uh, skills that are available to them? We know during this time that we've all had to adjust to very large and very sudden changes in the way in which we've worked. And as, so, as lockdown restrictions start to ease, we're all being asked to readjust again to a new, another new normal. And that's going to be difficult. People will feel anxious or conflicted about going back to work. Uh, people who have been on the front line and haven't gone anywhere except their workplaces will want to be want to be understood for that the experience that they've gone through. Um, and we also know that we'll have had different personal experiences of the lockdown period. So this is a time for truly compassionate leadership. And if there's one thing that we've seen in the course of this lockdown period, we've seen people, uh, we've seen uh, leaders, cats and dogs and toddlers, we've seen leaders be more human um, as they themselves have had to cope with their own uncertainty and managing some of the real challenges that we've all had to face. And I think if there was ever a time for compassionate leadership, the next year, two years is going to be the time for that. Compassionate leadership in a way that values our mental health, the work, the well-being that we have as individuals, but also the contribution that our well-being makes towards being truly effective team players towards achieving the goals and ambitions of our organisations. Let's hope we all think people, not buildings or balance sheets in the course of the next year. We think about our people, how to nurture and support them and help them to build as we come out and build the new normal. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you for that, Paul. I was just scribbling down what you wrote about think people. I'm gonna, gonna get that printed out and stick it above my desk just to remind myself. I think the challenge is massive, isn't it, when it comes to returning to office environments or whatever environment we're, we're returning to and, and how we do that as employers and, and managers and um, with, our, with our teams to make sure that we're doing that in the way that suits both the need of the organization and the individuals that work within it. So loads of food for thought there, thank you. Um, we are at the question and answer section. So we've had a number of questions come through. Um, what I'll do is read them out. I think then you'll be able to see them on the screen um, and our two guest speakers, Joe and Paul, will begin to answer those. So the first question for you both is, um, what would be your one tip for breaking down stigma in the workplace? Do you want me, shall I kick off with that one, Paul? Um, because it gives me another opportunity to ask people to go online and have a look at the impact series, particularly the one that we wrote um, about, uh, you know, delivering anti-stigma work in the workplace. But at the end of that um, uh, section, we've got our kind of top tips. And so I'm, I'm going to cheat and give you four. And um, I think the first is it's really important that you tailor your approach. Um, so every employer um, will be different and your employee makeup will be different too. So it's really important to make sure that you're um, tailoring that approach. Um, we found that providing um, tools, um, uh, you know, ready to go resources and activities is also really helpful. For me personally, there are two remaining top, top tips. And the first is that you have to ensure senior leader buy-in in order to really ensure that you've got, um, you've got um, longevity. And because it is one of the most powerful things to break down stigma and discrimination when you have senior leaders who are willing to talk about what is going on for them. And as Paul um, mentioned, you know, bringing leaders to life, um, I think that's really, really key and that's really important. And then the second really big thing for me is, is to have a network of champions, people who have personal experience, who are willing to talk about it, to share that experience, to be able to kind of help to um, help to, to kind of have that resonate with people in 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 the workplace so for me those last two are the really important things but all four are really important yeah i completely agree with all of those um joe and i think my other one one simply because you haven't mentioned only simply because you haven't mentioned it is the one about um measuring and understanding the, the nature of the workplace well-being of your workplace so, you know, that will give you the indication about whether you've got any sort of people who are feeling comfortable about speaking out about their mental health. So I think in many, many places, there's been a huge revolution of people feeling much more comfortable about this. But we still know the struggle. And I think it might be one of those COVID consequences that maybe people will feel a little bit 
less less paid for because they all had to put, all had to put on these double screen one dimensional zoom things. Thank you both. Um, sorry, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, listening to you the time um, The second question is: uh, How do we challenge stigmatizing language in the workplace without judging those using the language? So I think for me, this this is around um, language is really really important, and I think that we can sometimes get into the get into the phase where we feel like the kind of um, the language police, but it is important how people are referred to and, and what that banter looks like and how impactful that can be. For me, it's less about challenging the language and it's more around how do you create a environment in which that language simply isn't acceptable. And I, I, I think if you challenge, if you're in any situation, if you're challenging something that doesn't feel and look right for you in isolation and in a vacuum, that's really, really difficult to do. It's difficult to to, to be the person doing it and it's difficult to be the person on the receiving end of that. If, however, we've got a kind of workplace culture that, that actually um, helps to demonstrate what good behaviour looks like and what good language looks like and everybody's pulling in the same direction around that, I think that is the way in which we can do it, which makes it non-threatening, which makes it um, uh, you know, non-judgmental um, and, and makes people not feel stupid because they've inadvertently maybe said the wrong thing, um, and that builds much more likelihood that people will um, change their uh, change their way of, of speaking or change their way of acting. Yeah, and and, and I, th I think that's I think that's absolutely right. The culture of an organisation sets the tone, and you know we've made so many so much progress in other um other areas uh, I, I think we're learning a lot about how to set that environment where you know the the, the sort of you know the kind of casual stigma that can take place quite easily um and the key to that i think is about uh, those people who have their own lived experience to be able to talk about them about them in the house. So, for example, um, many organisations have the health champions um, who, are, who are really sort of able to be able to talk about their experiences. And I think that makes a big, big difference. Thank you, Brad. Um Paul, your uh, microphone on the last. Were slightly I was just checking the backstage, but it seems like we're just checking out. Um, the third question is um, How do we ensure workplace prepared for the long term on mental health, particularly for young people? That's the Thanks, um, Karen. Um, yeah, I think, I, think the, um, I think the starting point has got to be to think about where your uh, core um, community of workers are coming from and what are the impact what's the impact that's happened in your community or what's been the impact of covid on your in your community whether that's within the city or whether in the within the kind of footprint of your the places where you're most likely to be recruiting people um, and be ready for the for that to be something which is quite a long-term has long-term consequences. So let's take the example of young people. We know we've got, um, we know that young people, I mean, if you're 16, 17 or 18, you'll have had a really bumpy couple of years. You know, you've had, you may well be in the position where I, both your GCSEs and your A-levels are going to be affected in one, some shape or form. Um, it, if you're a little bit older, you'll have the impact on, um, uh, the, you might, may have impact on your, your university life. Um, and so that means that you might well come into the workplace in a different with a different kind of mindset almost, um, which means that that transition into the workplace needs some attention. And we are doing some in interesting work in our mentally healthy universities pilot with uh, in a number with a number of universities around the country, including the Beckett, I think, um, who are where we're looking at working with third year undergraduates to think about their transition into into the workplace how you get yourself ready for the workplace so probably for new recruits i would certainly think about 
putting the mental health and well-being of those new recruits right in the middle of your induction program, your onboarding program, um, to think about what needs they might have, offering wellness action plans to every new recruit in terms of thinking about what particular support they might need. And of course, we've also got a whole bunch of people, especially if you're working in an office environment, where um, you, you, may, you probably won't have met your colleague for maybe up to a year. I mean, which is really bizarre. So how do we in enable people to um, find that time to be able to have some of those face-to-face, -face, really genuine face-to-face -face conversations um, to sort of smooth our way back into, back into workplaces? We're certainly beginning to hear of um, organizations who are planning sort of getting to know you days for the rest for the workforce uh, and kind of welcome on board for people who happen to have joined in the last you know nine or 12 months so those kinds of things and then I think on the longer term piece as we start to begin to understand what what the the future of work is actually going to look like making sure that we put that people first principle into the heart of the work that we're doing Thank you. Joe, did you have anything about it? My only, I think my only thing would be to, to come, almost take a, to take a step back as well. I mean, I think the work that we've been doing with children and people over the last sort of, you know, 10 years, um, and, and this is, is less about kind of COVID readiness um, and the impact of that, but more around what we, what we are now, you know, we've changed the, we've changed the dial on, on mental health and the conversation around it. And young people now will vote with their feet. You know, they will come into new organisations and they'll be expecting that mental health and well-being will be a central core part of the employment experience. And I think that's the absolute right thing. Um, and, and so, again, when we talk about changing a generation, that's one of the reasons why we work with that kind of younger um, age range. And I think, I think employers... Um, do well to think that through, um, uh, and you know, and support what what really what Paul what Paul had said too. Thank you. Such an interesting insight. As the mother of a, a sixteen-year-old who's been desperate for an athlete insurance card for the last year or so, once that hit the doorstep, you realise that the, the, the job market has changed as well. There isn't necessarily the jobs that were there for sixteen-year-olds that there were even a year ago. So it's a really different world that they're going out into. Uh, their employers in mind. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have another question in the chat. Look from Emily. Um, aware that microaggressions and workplace wellbeing. What's the best way to be mindful of unintentional microaggressions? E.g., uh, oh, you're testing me here. Heteronormative assumptions and the best way to handle it when you've made a mistake. That's to both panel members. I, I think this is a um, really interesting question and important as we understand more and more about the experiences of um, of women and people from Black and Asian minority communities um, and some of the challenges uh, and people from uh, LGBT plus community in terms of some of the way in which um, uh, people can experience interactions in the workplace. Um, and, and, I, and I think this is both a, uh, for me, this is both a training piece where, um, you know, I think it's important to understand how your lived experience, where you come from, what you come to your work with, for encouraging people to be open in their workplaces about who they are, then, um, then we all, everybody in that workplace um, uh, also needs to understand it needs to have some understanding of that. So um, that's the first piece. And then I think, I think for me, when we talk about microaggressions, I think there's a that that that's the space for those sort of supervisor type conversations, the quiet one to one discussions where somebody hopefully feels as though they're able to say, "I really found that very difficult," or "I found this particular comment made me feel uncomfortable," and I know that they don't mean it but I also know that it made me feel uncomfortable. And so those sort of quiet, gentle um, nudging of uh, workplace behaviours are often the best way to approach, um, approach this, but within a framework of recognising that, you know, we're encouraging people to bring their whole selves to work. And if we want, if a workplace wants people to bring their whole self to work, then you have to be able to be able to 
to manage that within within your workplaces yeah and i think i think the only thing that i would kind of add to that and it comes from the experience that we've had over the years with with time to change i mean effectively all of the stuff that we've been talking about um, most recently is it has at its heart what you're trying to achieve is behavior change right you're trying to ensure that people feel that they can bring their whole um, selves to work and i think the two things that we found really powerful are the, the ability for people to be able to um, uh, talk about their own experience of, of, of those microaggressions to be and not in a kind of I've experienced it and now I'm going to give a talk about it but actually to have that as an underlying cultural thing that happens where people are able to share their different experiences because at the, at the heart of everything that we need to achieve is really that acceptance of difference and the acceptance of that that the, the, the multitude of skills and experience and thinking that, that makes us whole and actually that builds culture and that builds organisations and I would say builds really successful organisations when you do it well. So there's something around being able to kind of expose people to what that feels like because some people may either never have thought about it, would never have entered their heads and I would say that most people, I mean really most people, want to get it right. So the thing around, you know, how do you handle mistakes is to be able to say, I've made a mistake. And, you know, and I, and I think that particularly from senior leaders is really powerful. Back to that again, really powerful as well to be able to say, I hadn't considered that. I've now learned something. I'm now going to do something different. And the behavior that follows the I've learned something, I'm going to do something different is really, really, really important. So, I, you know, I think there's, there's something around there's something around that for me. Thank you both. Yeah, um, I would also say training as well. I've recently uh, redone the mental health first aid training, and, and what you were saying, Joe, reminds me of the sort of windows of the world. And actually, you know, what we what we see and how we perceive the world is exactly from what we've learned and what, well, how, the way we've grown up and and the things that are around us. And I think it's really important to have that empathy in the workplace um, and, and bring that perspective in. So I think workplace training. Um, and CPD is, is really important in that in that scenario as well. Um, I believe we've got three minutes left. Um, there's one last question, which is um, from me really, which was around uh, what Paul was um, saying around the hybrid working and just wondering if there was any um, toolkits or, or guidance that were available for employers on how to approach this next stage. Uh, there is definitely uh, quite a lot of stuff in production at the moment. As you can imagine, it's beginning to be the the, the, the sort of flavour of the conversation, isn't it? So um, the Mental Health at Work site will have some content on hybrid working uh, in the next uh, few weeks. Um, and, uh, you know, please do keep an eye on that and you can sign up to regular alerts to that site. Um, and our friends at the, uh, the CIPD, the Charles Institute of Personal uh, Development, are also producing some guidance on um, on hybrid on hybrid working as well. Um, I think it is going to be one of these test and see exercises where we're all we're probably many many workplaces around the country having very similar conversations. But um, you know we're going it, to it's an opportunity for us to all learn from each other um, and be open about it. I know we're currently having a, a, a live conversation about how we think about our offices and and i think the balance the, you know the reason why i say people first before offices and and balance sheets is because i think it's going to be quite easy for organizations to think first about the office the amount of money you're spending on your office rather than thinking about what's the best way to achieve the purpose of your organization um and so uh, that that that's that i think is going to be the first piece and i think asking we're hearing lots of organizations the civil service for example asking staff what they would like to do in terms of hybrid working um so it's got to be a people led thing really And I think the only thing that I would add to that, Paul, I think is absolutely right, is, is the ongoing assessment of how well it's going for people. Um, because I think that, you know, certainly at the beginning of the lockdown for me personally, I was like, yay, no commuting to London. And then kind of like, you know, six, nine months in, I'm like, whoa, I just want to get back on a train to Leeds to be with you all, exactly as you mentioned at the top of your presentation. So I think that ongoing assessment of, of what it feels like um, as the employee is really important. Thank you both so much for your time and, and your insight into today. It's been really valuable. Thank you. Um, 
we're going to move on. Um, so thank, thank you everyone for your questions as well. And please do keep sharing with each other in, in the comments in the chat. We have um, just short um, of five minutes to go. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome Victoria Eaton, who is the Director of Public Health for Leeds City Council, um, to help us to wrap up the session today. Hi everyone, um, and and thank you for that welcome. I'm, I'm mindful this is the uh, the end of a very busy conference, and we've got limited time. So um, I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, I do have some slides, but I'll um, I'll, I'll I'll move through through those pretty quickly, um, so we can finish on time. It was really interesting to listen to that. Um, Q&A session um, because it chimes with some of the things that I was going to reflect on um, just about impact of COVID on uh, mental health for us as, as a city. Next slide please. So yes, this is me. Um, I'm sure I've met some of the uh, some of you um, already, but um, if not, um, I'm, I'm Victoria Eaton. I'm the Director of Public Health at Leeds City Council. Next slide please. Um, <laughs> And uh, I couldn't not start my uh, my brief presentation by by um, not putting up one of these um, slides because it feels as if this has been what we've been li living and breathing within the public health community over the last year. Um, but I wanted to relate it to mental health and the work that you do as a network. So very briefly, this is the. Um, the 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 the, ca the cases um, positive cases of COVID of those of the, as they played out across the city for the last twelve months uh, it's quite different to the national curve you might notice we had our very highest rates in in October um, and obviously we're just coming down from from a, what we see as our third peak now. Um, I started uh, my job as Director of Public Health um, on the 1st of March last year. Uh, and we had our first two cases in Leeds on the 28th of February, which was the Saturday morning before the Monday. So, um, it, you know, it's been an incredible year, um, you know, a real challenge, um, but also a real privilege to work in a city with so many um, great colleagues and, and, and there's been a real collective um, response to to the pandemic. The, 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 the point of putting this up now is just to highlight that, um, as, as you, you all know, that for all of those cases, um, there's, there's real people and families and stories behind every single one of them. Um, and for all of us, whether we've been directly affected by um, cases and, and tragically um, fatalities, um, we've all got a different story to, to tell about the impact um, of this last year on, on ourselves and our uh, physical and mental health. So I, I, I just think that's a, it's kind of a, a useful reminder of what everybody's been through. Next slide, please. So I'm just conscious of moving through these pretty quickly, but this is a slide that people might have seen before. Um, and it's making the point that for each of those waves of cases of COVID, we know that there are at least four different waves of impact on a, on a community or on a, on a city. So the, the first wave is seen as the direct um, hit in terms of you know people who might be um, hospitalized or, or, or sadly die from from the virus um, there's then this this second wave around the impact of what that does for everybody else who who might be waiting for treatment or uh, affected in an indirect way um, a third wave around um, long longer term um, health impact so things like long covid and also impact on on other health conditions but most importantly what what's been called this this fourth wave this real longer term impact of the virus um, on economic recovery you know loss of incomes jobs um, livelihoods and, and and obviously in here is where we talk about that um impact on on men, longer term mental health and and mental illness across the population so um as we move through our response to the the virus um very rightly there's a there's a real focus on um how we're seeing the impact on on all of our mental health across the city next slide please I won't dwell on this. It's a very busy slide, and we've not much time. Um, 
so um, if you get to see the slides afterwards, it might just be useful to have a look at. The point of putting this up um, is in, in, in the very small print, in, in the third box down, there's one line that says that public health respond to outbreaks, but it's obviously a tiny proportion of, of everything we, we want to do across public health in Leeds. Over the last year, it's overtaken um, lots of important longer term uh, programs. So we, we're really keen to, you know, as we move through emergency response into the next um, phase and as we reset um, our, our public health agenda, um, we've, we're really mindful of not losing sight of the important um, priorities, um, including promoting mental health right across the city. So that, that was just a little bit of context for, for how it fits in with everything else we do. Next slide, please. Um, again, just, just very briefly, um, it, it, some of you may be very familiar with the work of Michael Marmot, who's um, worked for many years around understanding health inequalities. Um, and the, the most recent report that Michael Marmot put out was, was, was one called Build Back Fairer, um, which came out a, a, just a couple of weeks ago. And if you get a chance to have a look at this um, after the conference, please do, because it's got some really specific um, recommendations and, and intelligence in there about understanding the, the, the longer term impact on, um, on, on cities and communities um, and includes um, you know, employment and, and work and workforces with, within it. So it's, uh, we want to make this at the center of, of what we do. And the strap line on it is to build back fairer. So the challenge is to not go back to where we were, but, but reset in a different place. And just the next next slide, please. I think that um, I've just pulled off one slide from the report, which relates to um, the impact. This is for women in different professional groups. Um, and it just looks literally at that first wave of those people who sadly have lost their lives to COVID and how, that, how that's different across um, the different types of work that people do. We know that some people are much more exposed to the virus and have been much more exposed to the virus. Um, so, it, so it's not an equal impact across all of our um, professions and workplaces um, and again Marmot helps us to think about where we where we need to be putting more of our energy into into certain um, industries and, and to support certain workforces but again just to, to flag that with you as part of this conference. Next slide please. Um, Again, you, many of you may be very familiar with this slide, and I certainly won't go through it all. Um, but we we think there's a very um, very strong um, case for why we should all uh, invest in better mental health um, from a moral point of view, from an ethical point of view. But actually, we also have got a really strong case for for, for investing in better better mental health from a from an economic point of view too. Um, and so this is just a summary slide you may have seen before, but it's got some really powerful um, arguments for why investing in prevention and, and promotion of mental health, including workplace um, health in the top right hand corner there, um, is a sensible thing even on a on a economic um, financial level. So just a reminder of um, some of the tools that we've got to, to help us with this argument. Next slide, please. So um, that was a very, very um, quick rattle through some of the some of the headline um, issues for us at the moment. I just wanted to end um, with a couple of, of these points and I certainly won't go through everything on this slide. Um, because it's quite busy. But one of the things I wanted to highlight is the, the first point um, that I am the Director of health, uh, Public Health for Leeds City Council. Um, and as far as we're, we're aware, Leeds is the only council to invest in this kind of um, network. And we're incredibly proud to do that. Um, we, um, we absolutely recognise and feel so proud of, of the work that, that the network does. Um, and we, we, we know that it's going to be even more critical in, 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 in our challenges going forward and all the work that you, you've been talking about over the last five days. So um, just to say thank you and well done to everybody who's, who's involved. 
the agenda is huge, but um, there's so much good practice going on across this city. If, if anywhere is well placed to, to take this work forward, then Leeds is with, um, with the Mindful Employer Network at, at the heart of, of the um, mental health at work agenda. So um, just a real endorsement of, of all of your work and, and, and thank you and, and a real recognition for that. I've, I've, I've been um, past some th themes to highlight um, from the, the conference organisers um, and I'll, I'll go through these and then, and then hand back to, to colleagues. But I, in terms of some of the themes that have come out this week, um, just to highlight four of those. So um, there's been a real theme this week around peer support and needing to be able to support each other and ask for help. A real theme around inclusion, and it came out in that Q&A session just now, around bringing our whole selves to work, being able to feel safe and able to be ourselves at work. A theme around talking and how we create spaces to talk with open openness and honesty. And also around listening, around the need to listen well and also ask the right questions. And finally, cutting through that, and I know it's also always something that we, we, we see as um, it, incredibly important, um, this, this focus on kindness to ourselves and also to others. And I know there's been such great examples of, of all of those themes throughout this week. Um, so I just want to th thank you for everything that you're all doing and, and, and just to pass on our um, best wishes and, and full support for, for taking this work forward. And then very finally, um, just to say thank you for everybody involved in pulling this um, mammoth event um, together, uh, especially to uh, Laura McCulloch and all the speakers and panelists. So I'll, um, I'll end there, colleagues, and, um, and, and thank you all. And I hope I've stuck to time. Thank you, Victoria. That was great. Um, you definitely stuck to time. I think we ran over slightly at some point during the day, but as everyone will realise, the, the, the agenda's been so jam-packed full of great stuff that it's it's been very, very um, optimistic to fit it all in. So I really appreciate everybody sticking with us for a few extra minutes to um, to hear from Victoria. Um, I won't take up any more of your time um, other than to say um, in, in echo of what Victoria said, it's a huge undertaking um, to put a five day virtual conference on and, and Laura um, and, and the colleagues from Leeds Mind, um, those in the, in the background with technical support um, have been amazing pulling all of this together and I've been uh, really privileged to be a part of it. So um, also massive thanks to everybody for attending over the last five days and giving your time um, to, to be with everyone and reflect together in this space that we've here. Um, just to remind you that um, the delegate pack and every presentation from throughout the week will be available for th up to 30 days afterwards um, online. Um, we will also be sending, I say we, but it'll be Laura and Co. will be sending a, a feedback form out next week. Um, and there's also plans to create a, a LinkedIn group. So if you've um, enjoyed what you've heard today, please do keep connected with um, the Mindful Employer Network. It's free to join um, and you should be able to click a button at the bottom of your screen if you're, or if you're not already a network member. Um, and otherwise, thank you all very much for um, joining us and enjoy your uh, rest of your day. Thank you.